If you follow mobile filmmaking at all, you've likely heard the name Richard Lackey. Richard is a great filmmaker, colorist, I would say almost an iPhone evangelist, for sure a Filmic Pro evangelist, and he's a really humble guy, but man, does he know his stuff. I've been talking to him about being on the show for a while. He currently lives in Dubai. I'm in Texas, and so we have like a, what is that, 10 hour or so time difference. So it hasn't been super easy to schedule this call, but we finally got it done. And so today's episode is my conversation with Richard. Pretty wide-ranging conversation, actually. Talking, of course, about mobile filmmaking, iPhone filmmaking, Filmic Pro, but also some of his background, how he got into filmmaking, and that he is actually an American. Hey guys, Blake Calhoun, and this is another episode of Almost Professional, the podcast about mobile filmmaking, DIY filmmaking, indie filmmaking, really all things filmmaking. And today my guest is Richard Lackey. One quick technical thing before we get into the interview, I'm recording this podcast on my Neumann mic. It's a TLM-193. I've had this mic for years, and I decided to finally use it in my YouTube and podcast stuff. It's, a, of course, an analog mic. I'm using an iRig Pre that is XLR, and then I have it connected via lightning port into my iPad, and I'm recording it into the MetaRecorder app. I typically use a Yeti USB mic, or I also have a Sennheiser Hand Mic Digital, I believe is what it's called. And so I'm looking forward to hearing how this sounds, and I'll probably start using this on some of my YouTube videos as well. I mean, why not? This is a fairly expensive microphone. I think new it's about $1,500. Although in the professional mic world, that's not super expensive, but it is for most people, including myself. And otherwise, it's just gathering dust in the corner of my office. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation. All right. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. We've been talking about this for a little while. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's really exciting to be a part of your podcast. I, I'm honored that you'd ask me to uh, to come on. Oh, come on, man. When it comes to mobile filmmaking, only a select few, that, especially that are more towards the filmmaking side, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, mobile journalists out there who I'd like to talk to them too. But when it comes to mobile filmmakers, there's only a couple names that pop up and yours is definitely at the top of that list. So I'm happy to have you here. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Let me start by asking, that's how I know you from mobile filmmaking, but that's not what you do for a living, obviously. What do you do, not necessarily to make money, because I know you've done color correction, you've done a variety of different things, but it's all more high-end filmmaking. So how do you basically make a living? Yeah, well, I guess my my background has kind of, I've woven through a, a bunch of different things. Um, so I started out, um, early 2000s, I guess, um, actually as an editor. Um, so I was uh, offline editing um, a couple of kids' TV shows, um, weekly TV shows. And that was actually, I was living in South Africa at the time. And I'm, I'm US born, by the way, and I, I grew up in the UK. So I've always, I don't know, I've always bounced around a lot. So yeah, I, w- I was living in South Africa working as an offline editor. And then from that, I kind of progressed to doing online. Then I was kind of looking after uh, post for a facility, bounced around a couple of facilities, uh, was in Johannesburg for a bit, and then there's, they had a sister company in Cape Town. Um, they moved me down there. And yeah, that's where things really kind of got interesting for me because um, the facility in Cape Town at least sat above a film lab. So they did all their processing and, and uh, we had, you know, telecine scanning and post, uh, full post suites and everything. Um, and that's where things really kind of started to kick off uh, for me. I, I started post producing and, and got on some features and some uh, TV series as post coordinator, uh, kind of post supervisor. Um, and I was able to start actually shooting some film back then as well. The, the lab guys would come up and, and bring me short ends. Um, and I'd go off on the weekends and shoot them and bring them back on a Monday morning and pass them back to the lab. And uh, when they were, you know, testing the machines or whatever, or even just putting through a commercial job, they'd kind of push my stuff through. And then at the end of the day, I'd kind of go to the, you know, my buddies in, in the telecine suites and kind of just before they were clocking off and going home, I'd be like, oh, can you lace this up for me and just 
put it on this, you know, tape, and it was like mini DV tape or even HD cam tapes back then. And it was Telecine, um, you know, color correction as well. So, so yeah, that's when I really started to um, get interested in shooting as opposed to kind of everything had been more post uh, before that. But that's still, you know, a, a major passion of mine. So yeah, from then uh, I ended up in Dubai working for a production company here. I was looking after a lot of their kind of tech, um, including cameras, but you know, shared storage and network and post as well. And uh, yeah, for various reasons, decided to kind of uh, make a move out of that, maybe six years ago, I guess, and uh, started working for um, a couple of companies here that kit out and supply broadcast facilities, post facilities, um, TV studios. Um, so what I do for a living now, uh, in terms of you know how I uh, how I earn earn my uh, keep, is uh, business development and working with projects um, out here in terms of kind of broadcasters and studio builds and OB OB truck builds and and uh, and things like you that. You do training as yeah, well, I do don't a lot you? Of training. I see you talk about doing training. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of training. A lot of our partners, um, we, I mean, we're we're partners with Sony, with Vitek, so all the Vitek brands like Sattler, O'Connor, um, Autoscript. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I, because of kind of my long background, I guess, more on the technical side, um, I'm, I'm well suited to kind of um, doing training. So that's one of the roles that I do, yeah, uh, from, from a work capacity. I'm glad you brought up that you were from the U.S. because when I, you and I have known each other on Twitter for several years. Yeah. And then we actually met in person at NAB last year in Las Vegas. Yeah. And we went to the Film at Pro party and had a couple of beers. It was a good time. And then afterwards, we went driving around a little bit. And I just assumed you were South African I, all, because I had heard you speak before and you have a little bit of an accent, not much of one. Yeah, yeah. But then you told me you were born, I think, in Las Vegas. Yeah, Vegas is my hometown. Uh, I, I never... That's your hometown, so... Well, home. Home is a funny concept. I don't really know where home is. Uh, I mean, home is Dubai right now, but um, yeah, I, I didn't like grow up there. I didn't spend much time there when my family were actually stateside. We were more in Southern California. We were in San Diego area, but I grew up in the South of England. Okay. Yeah. And then 10 years in South Africa. So that's definitely long enough to pick up a accent. I think a lot of people would be surprised. I was, I didn't realize you were American. Yeah. That was surprising just because mainly since I've known you, you've lived in Dubai yeah. and you were yeah. always traveling internationally. You're, it seems yeah. like you go to Turkey a lot. And yeah, yeah, I just yeah. assumed you were from Europe or, or South Africa. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Europe and my, my wife is uh, from Belgrade, from Serbia. So that's Central Europe. So uh, I guess I feel more European than American, but my passport says I'm American. So <laughs> <laughs> you're, inter you're an international and yeah, your work takes so. you international too, obviously. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah, I I, I like to um, travel, not too much, but but yeah, my wife and I like to, to go to Turkey a lot. That's one of our favorite places to go. And I love to shoot there. It's actually, it's pretty much my favorite city to shoot. It seems like a lot of your photography and video stuff you do, especially when you're working with Filmic Pro, it seems like you have a lot of stuff from Turkey. A lot of stuff I've shot and have never shared or haven't even finished editing, actually. Okay. Oh, I know how that goes. <laughs> I tend to do that. So, I mean, I, I have projects sitting on my hard drives from all over the place like iphone se stuff some of it from back you know a few years ago sure iphone 7 plus stuff like iphone 10s max stuff and now even 11 pro max stuff that it hasn't seen the light of day yet but it's filling up my hard drives sounds like you've got a lot of good content to put out on your youtube channel <laughs> well yeah for maybe a few years if i were to get through it all yeah right yeah. well let me ask you this that You've got an awesome background, obviously, in traditional filmmaking, and you're a very technical guy, but you're also very creative. Is that how you got connected? Because a lot of people may know you from your, your writing at Cinema 5D. How did you get connected with those guys? Oh, that was, yeah, that happened even before I picked up a phone to shoot. That was maybe... That's what I figured. It was more about traditional stuff. Yeah, that yeah. was maybe... I don't even remember now, like maybe five years ago or something, or maybe six years ago. I don't remember anyway. Uh, it was, it was a little while ago. Yeah, no, I, I, I had my own blog going at that time, which has now been completely diverted and changed topic to, you know, uh, iPhone videography. Yeah. Back then it was called 
digital cinema demystified and it was a lot more about um, digital cinema tech and not really about products or specific cameras or anything. It was more about the, the actual technology behind it. And yeah, I, I got in touch with those guys or, or they got in touch with me. I don't really remember, but um, yeah, I jumped on the chance to kind of write for a, a bigger audience, you know, because it's tough to kind of, you know, everybody had a blog back then. And I mean, a lot of people still have blogs, I guess, you know, a lot of people have everything now. But yeah, to get a chance to um, write for a bigger audience uh, in that, that niche, I was like, yeah. So and then, yeah, it's been ever since. So. No, that's great. Because one thing I think that people like you and I, even though we have a lot of experience, I have a similar background to you. I have a very post heavy background, but I also DP a lot and I make my living mainly directing. Mm -hmm. I've directed a ton of commercials and feature films and, you know, the bread and butter is corporate video. It's not my favorite thing to do necessarily, unless my clients are listening. I love it. But if not, <laughs> you know, well, I didn't, I always say I didn't go to film school to make car commercials, but hey, they're, they can be fun and they do pay the bills. They pay the mortgage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. My point is, is even though we have a lot of experience and I'm, I'm sure you've encountered this, sometimes people and it's usually people that don't have any experience in mobile filmmaking. They wonder why we even mess around with this stuff. It's they look at it as the, you know, little league or something when and maybe it was five years ago, but the last few years in particular, the last two years or so, I really feel like the technology is getting to the point where it's a viable option and not just a novelty. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, for certain projects, let me let me let me be clear there. For certain projects, yeah. you're not going to do a broadcast TV show on it yet, but well, you never know. Um, I mean, you know, you 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 have the few kind of shows that have have come out on Netflix in the last kind of year, or or maybe a bit more than a year. Well, but, that's true. The Steven Soderbergh stuff, but that's definitely you know that's an outlier. That's not you know that's still not not the norm or anything and i and i'm not convinced or not sure that you know it's the right tool for for that kind of a job but yeah definitely i think the last maybe year or so maybe um i feel like perception has started to shift because i mean just in some of the conversations that i have with people even online that are definitely more in the the traditional uh, i guess side of things their skepticism or the skepticism that i'm feeling is is starting to get less skeptical and more curious yeah i'm seeing that too yeah and i think it's it's shifting and i and i think what will make it shift more is really uh the the proof is in is in the images you know uh, so i think when really people start seeing more being more impressed with the the images that are, are coming from mobile devices and you know whether that's through a, some you know a professional approach to post or not either way you know that's when opinions are going to start to to change and yeah i really think it's about it's about the right tool for the job you know absolutely i agree and i think it also helps recently there's been a flurry of announcements i guess is the right word or product launches but when bigger companies like Polar Pro, yeah, I just did a video and I think you got one too, have this new ND filter system. I think it's called, uh, it's called Light Chaser. Mm -hmm. When they put out stuff that's geared specifically for the iPhone, I think that makes people that are more skeptical or even professional filmmakers take a second look. It's like, wait, hold on. These big companies that make high end for, you know, pretty high end filters and such for traditional cameras are looking at the iPhone. And I don't think it's a cash grab necessarily. I really don't. I mean, while obviously they want to make money, I think they see that a lot of filmmakers are starting to use their mobile devices. Even, for example, in my work, I mainly shoot on traditional cameras for my professional stuff. Mm -hmm. But in the last couple of years, and I, did, I actually did this seven or eight years ago, it's how I got into mobile video with Filmit Pro. Yeah, the same with I me, would yeah. use, especially on corporate video, I would, I would use my camera for insert shots, for B-roll shots. Oh, like, okay. you know, if I'm just in my car and I'm like, boom, I need a shot. I don't have my, uh, at the time, whatever it was, it wasn't beta cam, it wasn't that long ago, but at yeah. the time it was like, I don't know, a Canon XHA1 or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I would I would grab a B-roll shot. And I do that today. And especially on my YouTube channel, tons of my B-roll is shot on my iPhone and I match it with my Sony A6400 or my Blackmagic cameras. 
And so the point is, I think when these other companies start to embrace it and then other filmmakers, it makes it, uh, legitimizes it maybe? Is that the right way to say it? Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, what we're also starting to see is some of the phone manufacturers are, are starting to kind of accommodate well, accommodate this or at least use it in their marketing. Sure. Well, Apple's been really good about that, getting these high-end A-list filmmakers to make their short films and like Snow Brawl. And there was the one that they did with the, the DP from Joker. He did a, a movie shot in, I believe it was Japan, yeah. a short film. That was really nice looking. Yeah. Now, granted, they have all this, they bring all the Hollywood tools with them and they basically wrap it around an iPhone. So there's a lot of extra accessories and stuff going on in a full crew, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that they're shooting on an iPhone. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to get that kind of look, um, a large percentage of that anyway, regardless of what camera camera is, it's being shot with is nothing to do with the camera. Um, it's production design, it's lighting, it's it's all kinds of things, you know. So yeah, I mean, you bring all that kind of stuff into a production that happens to be shot with an iPhone, it's it's going to look pretty good because of all, all the, the rest of the approach to the production. Right, because that is what, whenever you hear the overused word cinematic, it's often not just the camera. It's not just 24p or it's just, it's not just camera movement. It's everything you just said. Yeah. It's the, I mean, half the time could be just the, mainly the lighting, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, lighting and, and composition, I think. Composition, right. I think people underestimate the the effectiveness of you know composing a good frame that can go a long way to creating a, a shot or a sequence of shots that look you know cinematic um, and that again has absolutely nothing to do with the camera well and then on the higher end side and this is a little bit of a kind of going off on a tangent here but you know the dp uh steve yedlin yeah of course yeah yeah, yeah. he's one of my favorite i follow him on twitter yeah, yeah right absolutely. and he is he seems completely simpatico with you and what because you have this process you do on your iphone footage where you and i talked about it in the past you're basically and this is where i'm not super as technical near, nearly as technical as you but you're basically transforming the footage in davinci resolve you're like mapping it you're not using luts because you can't reproduce it with a lut and steve has been talking a lot about doing that exact thing he has these awesome samples i'm sure you've seen it where he takes Arri Alexa and 35 millimeter film yeah. and makes them look identical. You can't tell them apart. Yeah. And he says it's not the camera. No, it's not it's... the camera. The camera captures the information. What he's doing in post production manipulates it, and you're kind of doing the same thing. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I I think that the what his whole kind of mantra, I guess, is is fundamentally true, and it's it's not an opinion. Um, it's it's the science of it, and that is that there is a big separation actually between the look that you can achieve in in post, you know the the print look, the the you know the final look, and and what your camera is is recording. Right. Yeah. I mean, the whole kind of idea that that cameras have a built-in look. Um, and that you would choose a camera for a project even based on it has it has the Canon look, it has this Canon skin tones. Well, the color science that we talk about um, has to do with the processing that's going on in the camera. It's also what's going on in post as well. It's actually what's going on from the minute data is is read off the camera sensor all the way through whatever processing is happening in camera, you know, also through to what color bit depth is being recorded and then all the way through post and how it's being, you know, displayed as well. Right. And, and he talks about that. Yeah. I think you're mentioning exactly what he's saying. And that is that a lot of people have this idea of a look mainly because that is how it might look coming right out of the camera. Or maybe if you apply the manufacturer LUT to it, but that's not the way the actual image is there. I mean, you can pull out whatever you want. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying you can do this with an iPhone. We're talking about, he's talking about Alexa. And yeah. He actually mentions phones in his, in his video where it's like, and maybe in the future you could do that. There's just not enough information in an iPhone shot to do that with yet. No, exactly. And, and what I'm doing is a crude approximation that happens to satisfy me. What I'm doing is basically doing a lot of work with color charts. Right. I think Filmic Pro have done a lot with um, Log V2. Like, I think that's an amazing technology. And even though a lot of people say it's a pseudo log, like it's not a real log. And, and yes, there are limitations within the camera hardware of what Apple have uh, allowed 
uh, the encoder, I guess, to be able to do. I feel like it, it definitely gives you a couple stops extra. In the shadows, it does yeah, for sure. I've and, done and, numerous tests. You don't get much highlight recovery at all. No, and, and, and that's despite the fact that it's still recorded 8-bit. What I started doing was shooting a lot of charts, started that way. Yeah, creating a, a very simple rudimentary transform, I guess, that basically matches the Filmic Log V2 color profile uh, with or approximates a, a chart shot under the same lighting, under the same conditions um, in ARRI Log C. And of course, there's a massive difference in dynamic range and all of this, and you know, of course, but get a file um, out of that process that I started applying ARRI Log C LUTs to, or using Film Convert, which I do a lot with the ARRI Log C um, input profile. Uh, and I was getting images that I couldn't believe were, you know, um, coming out of this process. So, uh, and a lot of my favorite work, my best work that I'm doing now is, is coming out of that process. And, and I've found it to be um, very consistent. I've found it to be easy to do to the point where I'm, I'm wanting to share that with others now. It's, it's not perfect and it's 8-bit and there's all these caveats to it and, 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 but the end result I really like, <laughs> so. Yeah, the stuff I've seen you post, and I don't think you've posted, or maybe I've missed it. You've mainly posted like frame grabs. I don't know that I've seen yeah, I, a video on that yet. Maybe I have, I can't uh, remember. I've, yeah, I've posted a couple of videos that I've, that I, I've color graded that way. Okay, maybe I have seen that then. I'm mainly thinking about your Twitter feed. Yeah, yeah, I, I do share a lot of frame grabs too because um, there's so much stuff that I'm in the middle of working with that's not done and isn't going to be done necessarily soon. And so I, I like to share the odd frame grabs that I, I like um, because it's at least something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm working on something. You Absolutely. Know? And the videos will come, but, but I like to share, you know, something in progress at least that I'm working on. So One thing that I find fascinating talking with you and, you know, now or on Twitter or whenever is because you are so technical. And I consider myself a very tech savvy filmmaker. But when you and, for example, Chris Cohen, <laughs> the CTO, the chief technology officer of uh, Filmic Pro, for those who don't know, start chatting on, on Twitter, or I, I had a, a conversation with him at NAB mm -hmm. and like smoke came out of my ears because <laughs> literally the guy, it's amazing how, how much information he has, but a lot of it just goes over my head. And I, again, I consider myself pretty tech savvy, but he developed Log V2. And so is that one reason that you gravitate towards Filmic Pro or did you like Filmic Pro before no, they had their log Yeah, profiles? I was using like Filmic Pro, like you said earlier, like a, a lot of this started with, with Filmic Pro for you. It was the same for me. So, I mean, I had this iPhone 5, I guess it was. This was now years ago. And I was living in Belgrade at the time, actually. I was just there for, for a short time uh, in between jobs. And I th was thinking to myself, okay, let me see what I can do with this. And I wasn't happy with the video at all. Um, so I kind of gave up on it a little bit, but then I got an iPhone SE and okay, it had its issues. It would overheat a lot. I mean, it would heat up a lot and, and it, did, it, was only a, it was only a 16 gig device, so I didn't have much space. But suddenly the, the because it had the same uh, image sensor, I guess, and, and a lot of the same processing or the same innards as the success, and it could record decent video. And the first app that I started using was Filmic Pro. And uh, I, I put one video out, I think, on my YouTube channel where, I mean, I, I don't even know. I think I had like 10 subscribers or something. They're probably all my family and right. <laughs> something like that. And uh, yeah, I shot this one video and I, I color corrected it like I would color correct footage from, a, I guess, a, a real camera. Was that the one with the boats or the water? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I shot it down in Dubai Marina. Marina, uh, that was it, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's one of the earliest ones. And that really blew up. Uh, and that's, I film like, kind of, I got in, we started talking or whatever, and, and I started beta testing and testing different features and kind of, I guess, more from a, uh, a post perspective um, as well. Um, and yeah, then that, that just, that relationship led from there. And yeah, Chris, I, I, I like talking to Chris because it's all about problem solving. Um, and I think that's what excites me so much about shooting and post-producing uh, video shot on these devices is because it's all problem solving. Like Log V2 is all problem solving. If it was easy, 
you know, it, it wouldn't be as much fun, you know? So yeah, it's kind of how do we squeeze uh, as much dynamic range as possible, you know, w within the limitations of what the ho what Apple's letting us do with the hardware, um, within an 8-bit, you know, limited bit rate encoding as well. Amazing creativity comes from having to solve those problems. And, and that's where uh, I find what Chris and, and the team uh, does is so fascinating. And that's what I like doing myself too. Right. Um, is like, you know, seeing, ah, oh, this isn't working or this isn't working and not giving up, but being like, okay, what if I approach it from this, uh, you know, angle or what if I use this piece of kit that's not really made for this, but I can kind of jerry rig it on here. And, you know, <laughs> you, know you kind of solve problems and you figure it out. Well, let me ask you, because this is a topic that I don't know that much about, and this is something that you and Chris especially know a lot about, and that is the whole computational imaging part. And I get it more for photography, but the Log V2 incorporates that. What about the idea of Filmic Pro and Apple maybe letting them have more control over the image, like being able to turn HDR off if we want to, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, I think Log V2 is really... Um it's a solution because, because there's no other way around it. It's, it's not ideal. Ideally, they would have, or any third party, you know, camera app manufacturer would have um, a bit, would have more access to image data earlier in the chain, earlier in the processing chain. And it, it also has to do with the limitations of the encoder in a particular device as well. And that's changing now. A lot, a lot of the, the phones I think we're going to see uh, this year are, or may hopefully will uh, have encoders that, that allow a higher uh, bit depth, uh, color bit depth encoding. So yeah, log V2 really, and the whole kind of gamma vectorization thing uh, and it came from uh, okay, the sensor plus processing pipeline to the encoder to the buffer, image buffer that we can have access to gives us this. Um, but we need some intermediary information that isn't there. But if we create an algorithm that can analyze what we do have, make some computational projections, we can start to fill in some of the gaps and make up information that wasn't actually there, but it's it's likely and and accurate enough that um, it ends up looking as if it was there. And I think that's what you know log v two does that incredibly well. In fact, I've not really ever seen any artifacts or any you know uh, issues with with what filmic have implemented in log v two, but it would be great if it wasn't necessary. right. Some people like to just use the native app because of the HDR and they think it looks better than log v2 in certain situations. I don't, I don't agree with that. I've not had that experience. The native app, because of its very low bit rate, to me, even sometimes in bright light can be kind of noisy. And then you get, you get the funky colors because of the HDR. Don't get me wrong. It can look really good. It can look very good. But I still tend to think that using a third-party app like Filmic Pro, you get better results. Well, I think it's a case of consistency. Um, like, I stay away from the native app just because it does some funny things in some in some light conditions, um, and it makes my life more difficult when I want to color correct. Like, I I need consistency. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's why I've come to even like locking my white balance. Um, so even in Filmic Pro, I pretty much lock it on daylight all the time. That's I preach that constantly to people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Because that's the killer about the native app is it changes all the time. Yeah, it changes all the time. So I, I lock everything. So exposure is set correctly and locked. Um, white balance, I keep it at, at, I just use the daylight preset. And I shoot and then things are a lot more consistent in post. That's what I've found. Um, so even though there still are some shifts um, that happen and that at the moment can't be bypassed. Right, and that's the AI, the, that's the AI from Apple, right? Or the... Yeah, there's, there's stuff, there's some tone mapping going tone on mapping, that, right. that just, can't, just can't be bypassed. It's, 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 you know, baked into the image processing and I get that. I get it except for our cameras are supposed to be pro cameras. That's the part that I don't get, but hey. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, but it's not real. I mean, yeah. I pro pro a, filmmakers whole... want manual control over everything. And not just that, but they want they want a, a, a gamma that doesn't shift. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's 
you know, that's the thing that always bugs me about the whole thing. Like, they're trying to build effectively AI color correction into the camera processing pipeline, which is great for consumer device. Yep. Um, but when you want to use it, you want, you want to make those decisions yourself. Um, you don't want to be recording an image where luminance levels are shifting on you. <laughs> like, what are you going to do with that? Like, like that's, that's, it can be enough to, to ruin a shot. Oh, you know, for sure. It's, it's ruined, slight, it's ruined you know? a lot of my shots. And I know I'm still having trouble with it. You say you're not. Not so I'm much. I'm moving shots when a, when a high contrast, like a, if I'm shooting something bright, and a dark object crosses the frame, the whole camera, and even with everything locked down, everything blooms and it drives me insane. Yeah. And so, and so it's like Apple wants it both ways, though. It's like they want to make it for a consumer device, which is great, you know, shooting your kid's birthday party. But then they have all these A-list filmmakers doing their short films for them. And it's sort of like, which, which way are you trying to go with this? <laughs> you know what? I, I think I've just gotten very good at avoiding the types of shots where I know it's going to happen. Yeah, and that's a good way to go. You got to know its limitations and then you can work with it. And I think that has been uh, an approach that I've taken from the very beginning when I first started shooting with that iPhone SE. Um, I very quickly started seeing things that were like, look, this isn't going to work. It's probably never going to work. Just don't shoot this. And, and I get people asking me questions all the time, especially low light stuff like not reasonably low light but like really low light stuff and i have to tell them like look the phone's not the right thing just don't do it you know it's it's not going to work it's a waste of your time and there are certain situations like until recently i guess well until with the 11 pro max any really high contrast backlit situations um like like shooting into uh low bright sun you know or there were certain situations like that that, again, I, w I would just avoid. I just wouldn't shoot those shots. Like if, if I, or I, I would find a way to shoot something else or shoot around it or whatever. I do think that the 11 Pro Max has, has made big strides and uh, there's not that many kinds of shots that are, I can't do with the 11 Pro Max, actually. E even shooting into the sun, backlit, high contrast. I've had no problem with that. Yeah. I did a video recently and I was shooting the sun and I was, when I looked at it in editing, I was like, wow, that, that actually looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, but the it had a nice Max, roll off around the edges. It wasn't just this big, bright, yeah, yeah, it's shiny. Not, it's not too bad. I still have a lot of problem with low light though. I really do. And it seems like you're kind of the low light king. You and I talked about this a couple of years ago. I think I've been meaning to get you on my YouTube channel. What is your secret besides you did tell me the other day, I asked you about certain low light and you said, well, if I, if I can't get below ISO 100, I think it's like, I just don't shoot. That's one thing I do. <laughs> yeah. I, I just don't bother. So, I mean, uh, like the stuff that I, I'm very selective over the stuff I share too. So I, I only put my stuff up that, that has come out well. Yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of stuff that's just full of noise and it's just like unwatchable. Well, yeah, or I don't, or I, I don't bother shooting it. Yeah, no, that's a good uh, point. In the first place, because, because I know there's no point. I just, in cinema, in filmmaking, the thing that often in any kind of movie, really, when you're shooting in a room with, you know, moody lighting, not film noir necessarily, but just even like in my living room when I'm using light coming through a window, I love that kind of natural light. And it looks great, but then you get it back in post and the shadow side is just full of noise. and so. I've learned to denoise a lot, and uh, that's fine. I, yeah. de I denoise all my cameras, though. It's not just iPhone. Yeah. But it's just one thing. Your my mindset is thinking that the shadow side should be okay because I'm still shooting low ISO. But I think it's the I believe it's the AI and the phone trying to push those shadows up. Yeah, exactly. So what's happening is even if you're doing the best you can by keeping your ISO low, even minimum which is zero gain always, that's where you're going to get your cleanest shot. The AI is still trying to lift the shadows and that's where you're still getting some noise in there. But it just depends. I, I, I don't know. I find some, some things come out really nice and some things don't. I do too. And that's the whole thing about consistency that's not there sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I'm always trying to notice patterns or recognize like what is it that's consistently tripping it up and what is it that's working nicely. Like sometimes I'll shoot We've got these massive fountains at the Dubai Mall here. 
Um, similar to the fountains at the Bellagio in Vegas. Actually, it was the same company who put them in b both uh, places. Okay. Um, and I like to go shoot there at night. And, you know, the, the fountains are all lit up, but everything else is, you know, it's nighttime. It's dark, you know. And, and I've gotten some nice stuff of the fountains, also in, of the Bellagio fountains as well. Is that using log v2 or is that using like natural setting? Yeah, I still use log v2, but I'll, I'll keep the ISO low. Um, you know, I'll shoot some people that are watching the fountains uh, or whatever in silhouette. You know, they'll just be black. You can't see, but you see the shapes of the people and their heads and whatever. And these massive lit fountains, you know, in the, and they're nice wide shots. And, and those always come out nice. But, um, you know, sometimes like shooting inside, things that even things that should be dark and black, end up lifted a bit and noisy so it ends up like this muddy gray I, I don't know yeah trying to figure out all, constantly what is the pattern like what's working what's not working yeah it's hard to tell low light is one of the biggest limitations that i run into do you think computational imaging will help low light in the future like it has on the photography side or is that beyond the realm of what it could potentially I mean, do i mean they're talking about i know samsung already has the live focus thing, but it's only for, I think like Instagram type videos. I could be wrong about that, where you can get bokeh now with live video. Oh, okay. And so I'm, I'm assuming that that will come to the iPhone, but I'm wondering, I would be more interested potentially with better low light because we have these DOF adapters that I want to talk to you about here in just a second. But what do you think about computational imaging and low light for video? I really don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit more... On the low light side of things, I'm a little bit more on the traditional side in terms of a solution rather than the, the kind of computational side where I kind of feel like bigger sensor. larger sensors. Yep. <laughs> but the problem is like Samsung with their latest phone, uh, they've got a much bigger sensor, probably the biggest sensor I've seen in a, in a, in a uh, phone. That's is that the, the new S20, IMX the new 8K video? 586, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it's 8K, so they've put in a bigger sensor, but they've, you know, put in a whole bunch more photosites, so it's more dense and they're smaller again. So that'll mean that'll be more video noise. Well, not necessarily. It depends how it's processed. Um, you know, if you have more samples, even if they're noisier, you can start averaging and you can start doing different. With noise reduction, you mean? You know, math on it. Yeah, you can start doing different things with it. So, yeah, I don't know. I think we're we're also. Um, you know, coming up against the limits of sensor design and, and the limits of physics and in terms of, uh, you know, and also cooling, like, I guess the, you know, the warmer any image sensor gets, the hotter it runs, the, the noisier it's going to get. Um, and that's why, you know, our, our Aries and our Reds and, you know, even the Blackmagic design cameras have big cooling systems built in. A phone is, doesn't have space for that, you know, so it's all. Although I will get... say the the bigger, the new iPhone 11 Pro, I've been amazed at how well that thing does. It doesn't overheat anymore. Oh yeah, no, it doesn't get warm at all. And I can I can shoot for forever on that phone. Yeah, no, it's- My, it's... my 10 S Max could, if I was shooting in any kind of heat at all, even not even in the sun, just in heat, that thing and shooting log, that thing would overheat in about 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, and the the phone I was shooting with before the XS Max was the Seven Plus. Oh man, that thing would it would just overheat all the time, and especially out here in Dubai, like oh god, in the yeah. summertime, <laughs> you you cannot, you just can't go shoot outside anywhere because it's you know approaching fifty degrees centigrade. Um, I mean, I know you guys are Fahrenheit over there. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit. It's hot. 115, <laughs> 120, I don't know. In the winter time, it's okay here. Uh, I have no problems now. Um, it's kind of normal, decent kind of temperatures. But yeah, the, the 11 Pro Max, is, uh, is a, it doesn't warm up at all, and it's, it's very stable. Um, that was one of the first things that impressed me about it, using it for the first time. Uh, it didn't lock up. Um, the app didn't crash. It didn't drop frames, and it didn't get hot. Um, and I was like, Good one, guys. Nice. <laughs> yeah, no, that the reliability, I think, has been much better. Although I don't know if I'm getting any better low light. No, I, I, I've actually debated whether my 10s Max is better in low light potentially, but it may just be my imagination. I don't know. Yeah, I need to shoot more low light. Um, I'm actually shooting something at the moment for B script with their new anamorphic lens, um, and I'm shooting all over this city like over a couple of, I can pretty much only shoot on my weekends. So I'm kind of trying to hit a lot of different locations and, and some of the stuff I want to do is definitely at nighttime. 
Um, and it's been a while since I've done some dark, some, some low light stuff. So I'm looking forward to kind of digging into that and seeing what the image looks like. That sounds cool. Yeah, I'm actually going to be testing that soon too. And I've been testing, I want to just, a couple more things I want to talk about before we, we wrap this up. Sure. But I have been playing with the B-Script depth of field adapter, uh, that one in the Ulanzi. Yeah. I've been really torn because, again, my idea of mobile filmmaking is more mobile. Yeah. But in saying that, I know that I try to approach things as more of a traditional filmmaker. And so in certain situations, I'm finding it is actually pretty fun and pretty cool. It's not mobile by any stretch. The argument you hear, and I've made this myself, is if you're going to rig it up like this with a cinema lens on there or a bigger lens and all that, why don't you just use a regular camera? And that is potentially a valid argument. Yeah. But I will say, I just shot a bunch of stuff this last week from a recent video I put out, the one about Polar Pro, and it looks really good. It's surprisingly good. Focus, of course, is an issue. I have a lot of experience in the past using DOF adapters. Back in the day, I used a lettuce adapter mm -hmm. on my Canon XHA1. It yeah, was an I remember, HDB camera. I remember those. <laughs> yeah. And, and back then, you had to, the thing, you, you had to turn a motor on. Yeah. And I would always forget to turn that motor on to spin the ground glass or vibrate the ground glass. Yeah. These don't have that, which is great, but it still puts a texture on the image that you, you can't replicate in post, which I like a lot. It gives it a much more, for lack of a better word, cinematic look and feel. And so I've been, I've been enjoying playing with it. I don't know how much I'll, I would use it on a regular basis, but what, what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, it's super fun. I, again, I'm, I think I'm in the same boat as you, but I, I'm kind of undecided. I'm not sure. I have a lot of fun shooting with it, but it's because it's what I have, you know? I, I mean, I don't have a, you know, I don't own or, or have a, a larger sensor, uh, uh, you know, camera. Well, and in, that, and in that case, it's perfect. Yeah, and to be honest, I, I don't think I would take it out and shoot with it because I'd wanna take the phones all the time, even with all these accessories, because it's fun. The process with the phone is, is a lot of fun. I really, I, I totally agree with that. Just kind of going out and it's, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's, it really is fun. It's kind of like, there's discovery to it, you know, and there's experimentation to it and, and things like that, you know. I agree. And it's almost like with a traditional camera, it's like you, you're expected, you're going to shoot good looking footage with a Canon EOS R, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm not, I'm not really interested in it. Like it's, it's too, there's no challenge there, you know. But the depth of field adapters I like. I've also been using both the Ulanzi and, and the B-Script. The B-Script I prefer. Um, I don't know whether it's just in my head. Um, but it, it looks to me like that texture that you were talking about is a bit finer on the B-Script than on the Ulanzi. I, I might be completely wrong about that. It's just... I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. Because one thing, and I'm, I'm going to do a video about this for my channel. One thing I like to do is reframe and in post yeah. or push in, you know, especially if I'm doing B-roll. That way I don't have to shoot it twice. Uh -huh. I notice when I push in on shots that, and I, I'm editing in HD, I'm shooting 4K. When I pop in 50% or more, 100%. I see that it almost looks like video noise, but in reality, it's the, for lack of a better word, the ground glass I'm seeing. Yeah, yeah. Which is another thing that you just have to know it's there and, and plan ahead and work around it. Yeah. But uh, it does give it a, a really interesting filmic texture. I really believe that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think the image is a little bit softer, but, um, you know, that's a look too that I like. I do too. It takes away that electronic edge. Yeah, I mean, I shoot with a um, Black Promis, the Tiffin like diffusion filter all the time anyway for that reason. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it has a nice kind of soft, slightly soft look. Um, I'm using it with a, an, a, my favorite uh, lens from my favorite film camera, actually. It's, it's an old Helios, you know, 58 mil, the 44.2. Uh, and it's it's an imperfect lens anyway, you know. But, but that's, um, that's what makes it great. But it looks great, you know. And, and I was watching something the other day. Narcos Mexico, the latest season, they've shot anamorphic. And I haven't been able to figure out or look up what lenses they used. But if you look towards the corners and even just above the top of the frame, the top and bottom of the frame and the corners... It's, it's very um, defocused. That's what these adapters do too. <laughs> it, it looks to, yeah, exactly. I, I was noticing it and I was like, that looks, it looks kind of like what my DOF adapter is doing. Um, but they've obviously chosen that look, you know, I think they are probably using some vintage anamorphics or. Right, some yeah. of those anamorphics can create that real swirly bokeh. Yeah, they've got that. And, and I was like, huh, oh, that kind of looks like what my B-script 
DOF adapter does. Maybe they're shooting on the <laughs> iPhone not... 11 Pro. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it did make me think of, well, maybe it's not so terrible. Maybe it's not so bad that it does that if, you know, this show is going for that look. Absolutely. You know? But I, I think it's an interesting one because, again, it forces you to um, be deliberate uh, in how you're composing your shots, you know? I've learned to really have to use Filmic Pro's peaking, and the thing is, their peaking is yeah. not perfect by any stretch. No. I, Since it's contrast-based the way it is, I mean, even when stuff is blurry on the screen, it will still have some green around it, so you really have to fine-tune it, I'm finding. Yeah. I'm actually starting to use an external monitor with, with better peaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also putting your subject uh, towards the middle of the frame. Um, where it's going to be sharp. Right. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. And, and layering, like having objects, you know, closer to the lens towards the edges of the frame, that it's going to be out of focus anyway. And objects, you know, further in the distance, also towards the edge of, of, of the frame where it's going to be blurry anyway. Then it kind of hides that weird optical defocus in the corner. What millimeter lenses are you using? Uh, the, well, I'm using the 58 mil, so it's it's uh, I guess it's a bit it's a longer, I suppose mid mid longer lens. I guess it's a portrait lens, I suppose. Well, what's interesting is I started off using um, I'm using Rokinon in their full frame. I started off using a 50 millimeter, and I could never get anything tack sharp. I couldn't, and it would be tack sharp on the peaking. Oh, interesting. So I switched to a 24 millimeter, and all of a sudden everything looks awesome. Yeah, it looks so good, and it's sharp as a tack. My lens, I know, is good. I've used it on my traditional cameras a lot. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, I need to do some more testing. I'm actually going to, I don't necessarily like doing these in videos, but I'm going to do a very technical video where I shoot some focus charts. Yeah. And I want to know what lenses work better, whether, you know, just, again, it, it may end up being the, the, the lens and it has to be full frame. I learned that the hard way. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I have a 16 millimeter that was a super 35. And it looked like I was shooting through a tunnel. And when you zoom in on it, even the sides just looks, you talk about out of focus. It's just, you could never get anything in focus. Yeah, no, it's definitely one of those, it's one of those tricky things. Like I would never advise anybody to use a DOF adapter at all um, that were not willing to be patient and, you know, take their time. And, you know, anybody who just wants the result that adapter is not for them. It will drive them nuts. Did you watch the Filmic Pro short film called No Hard Feelings? The one that uh, it was one of the contest winners, or I guess it was it wasn't, didn't win, but it was one of the, the top five films. Uh, I may have done, but it's not in my. It brain was right it was now. shot in Indone Indonesia at the beach. Oh, uh, okay. So those guys shot on a the B script, and they used I don't know what lenses. I've actually reached out to the DP. He's an Australian guy, and I'm going to have him on my show. Uh, I'm making a video about what they did, Cool. but I thought that looked great. And they have a really cool behind the scenes video. And I was really surprised because that was an involved short film and they used the B script on the whole thing. And I thought the same thing. I'm like, wow, it's a cool look, but it's like, I don't know if I'd want to be on set right now doing that because it can be really finicky and tedious. Yeah. I don't, I also, I, d I don't think it's necessary. Like I, I think that, you know, people forget that when you look at a lot of older films that are often considered very cinematic, again, to use the word, you know, from the 50s, from the 60s, even earlier than that. Every Stanley Kubrick movie, pretty much. A lot of them were shot with a very deep uh, depth of field where an awful lot is in focus. Deep focus, for sure. Yeah, I agree. I actually, I like shooting that way because it forces you to create a sense of depth through your composition and and through where you, how you place objects and how you use perspective and leading lines in your shots blocking too i mean depending if you have actors. yeah blocking and i i really like that i i think the very shallow depth of field thing has kind of become a crutch a bit in in recent years i, I mean, don't disagree it's nice to be able to black out your set design that wasn't finished or whatever <laughs> oh of course no i like the look i'm, I'm not saying i don't like it i just uh, i i don't i'm i'm of the opinion and there there are you know many opinions um that it's not necessarily one of the big disadvantages of shooting on a, a, a mobile device no i'm I'm with you too I, I i totally agree i mean i do like it's a bit of a cop out yeah i don't i don't you disagree just shoot. i do like being able to isolate something or i like being able to to do a focus pull to bring your attention as a director you know to an object yeah and so that i do like but 
Otherwise, the idea of having shallow depth of field just for the sake of it is that makes it cinematic is is silly. I think it is cinematic and I like it, but it's not the be all and end all. And that's it's what I mean too. That's exactly necessary. what I mean. I don't disagree. It's not a prerequisite, right? No, that's a good way to say it. It's certainly not a prerequisite, and especially like shooting with the the anamorphic lens adapters, where you, you you know I love shooting these wide vistas and these big shots, and that's what I've been trying to capture um, with this new B script. Is these is wider Sergio Leone stuff? Yeah. I want everything to be crisp. I want everything to be in focus because you're you're getting these dramatic uh, wide shots and, and uh, I don't know, just it, it depends. No, I completely agree. Well, I've got one more thing I want to talk about and that is the future basically. And this is, this is all speculation, but like the iPhone 12, you mentioned how you had heard the certain things about what is coming in regarding HDR. I don't think Apple's going to embrace 8K video anytime soon. What do you think is coming? I've heard the next, not the next phone, but maybe the phone after that might be not have any ports. They want to do everything wireless, which, yeah. you know, I see some issues there for filmmakers. It might be cool just for making, you know, charging, making calls. Yeah. But, you know, copying files from your com- phone to your computer. I use AirDrop a lot, but for larger batches, I do think it's nice to connect it with a cable. And I've even heard rumors where the phone as we know it may quit being a phone, maybe a wearable device like an Apple Watch. I mean, that would take it completely out of our hands. But I'm just curious what your thoughts on where the iPhone goes in the next couple of years. Oh, I'm the wrong person to ask for that. I really, I, I really don't know. With Apple, you never know. They, they, they tend to surprise. But I, I think we can... You never know. I, I doubt that they're going to go 8K. I'd be very surprised if we find a... a 8k sensor in in the next iphone i really don't think that's likely but i mean who knows it's possible i'd much rather see 10 bit prores lt or something i i would like oh i don't think prores uh, i don't think that's likely no, i would like to see too, it it's but too I, heavy i think they're gonna stick they're gonna stick with i think hevc like h265 is really where things are at with phones yeah I agree. And I, I kind of don't really see that changing anytime soon, but maybe higher bit rates. Uh, you know, I mean, now with Film uh, Extreme and, you know, you can push it up where in H.264, it's up close to 140 megabits now. I'm not sure what uh, the HEVC um, is there, but I think we're going to see, uh, yeah, hopefully finally 10 bit color. Yeah, maybe the ability to even push up the the bit rates higher. Chris would be the person to talk to about that. He's he's probably has has ideas of where things are going. Although I I don't know that he learns anything officially any more than the rest of us do. Um, but they do, you know, they they probably know a little bit more. I'm not sure. The thing is, I really wonder because you know when the Canon 5D came out, Canon was never anticipated that filmmakers would grab onto it. They made it for news photographers who were needing to start shooting video for the web is the way I always heard the story. Yeah. And I really feel like in a way the iPhone has kind of gone in the same direction, meaning yeah, the video was really meant from soccer moms, but filmmakers being, you know, DIY type attitudes or, you know, Absolutely. have taken it and pushed it. And I, that's one thing that I do and I know you do too. I like to push these devices to their limits, but then the companies, Canon, Apple, they start saying, hey, wow, these things do work pretty well. So now we're going to do this, that, and the other. And so I really do hope that Apple will, and they've, they've done it on the computer side. They're coming back to the pros. And then they named this latest phone a pro phone in quotes for sure. But I think it would be awesome if they would include more pro features for the, what is it, 1% of their audience that actually looks at that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I, it would be nice, but I'm not going to stop. Uh, I'm not going to stop trying to work around their limitations anytime soon. No, uh, I'm, I'm expecting the limitations and, and the frustrations to stay there and that I'm still going to have to work around them. So but, you know, it, it would be nice um, if they would allow, you know, uh, proper, you know, f- fixed gamma uh, encoding for HDR, maybe, you know, in 10 bit color and and. Uh, it'd be great if it was, you know, uh, 422 instead of 420, if there was more color information in the file. But, you know, all those things considered, like, I'm pretty happy with what I see on my monitor when I when I color grade this stuff. And I've been lucky enough even to see some some stuff that I've I've color graded. Well, not for a long time, but even up on a big screen. And it looks pretty good. And, and so 
I don't know. I'm I'm not complaining too much. Like I think I think filmmakers have a lot they can work with, um, and very few excuses. And there's so many ways to learn. Like you can learn literally almost anything, including uh, color grading. You know, even to a, an intermediate or an advanced level online. So the information is out there, and and a lot of it, especially on the post side, applies to color grading video from your iPhone the same way as color grading video from from a, a, an Arri Alexa. You know, the underlying principles are the same. The principles of color correction are the same, and a lot of the steps that you take are the same. So yeah, I think it's an exciting time for filmmakers. I think they that there's no reason not to pull the phone out of your pocket and shoot a short film or, or shoot a documentary or even shoot a first feature. Um, and it can look amazing. Like that's, that's where we're, we're living right now. So that's exciting. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's a great way to end this conversation. I think we are very lucky as filmmakers to be living in this time that we live. I really do. It's, it, we're almost spoiled. I gotta be honest. <laughs> oh, for sure. Well, thanks again, and um, I will talk to you maybe at NAB this year. I don't know. I haven't decided if I'll be there or not, but I hope to see you in person again in the near future. Yeah, let's see. That would be great. All right. Thanks, Richard. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, that was a great conversation with Richard. I really appreciate him being on the show. I've been trying to get him on the show for a while, and I've actually been trying to get him on my YouTube channel as well to do like a collaboration. And I'm still working on that. I want to do a low light collaboration with him on shooting uh, mobile video, shooting on our iPhones and Filmic Pro. If you don't follow Richard on Twitter or if you're not subscribed to his YouTube channel, great content there. You should definitely subscribe and follow him. I'll put his links in the show notes. And also, don't forget to check out his blog. It's geared more towards the technical side of things, but that's the stuff that I find really interesting, especially trying to take your footage and take your projects to the next level. And I didn't ask him to say this, but he started talking about color grading resources online, and that ties in perfectly to my new color grading course for LumaFusion. I've been talking about this for a while, and yes, it's now available on my website. It's a color grading 101 course, it's for beginners, and it's for using LumaFusion on your iPad or your iPhone. I talk about using LUTs. I also talk about all the gear you need to get started. And of course, you can just use your iPad, but with a few simple accessories, kind of like with your iPhone, you can really create a very cool color grading studio in your office or at your house or for on location with a few accessories and tools that you may not have thought about. It's also great that you can now export XML from LumaFusion into Final Cut Pro. So now you can use LumaFusion as an offline editor or a place to do rough color correction, color grades, maybe to show a client or to show a director if you're on location, but then finish in Final Cut Pro using video scopes and plugins and that kind of thing. So there's really a lot of possibilities. And I gotta say, I haven't done a ton of LumaFusion work in the past, but I'm really getting more interested in it because of these new offerings. And by the way, I did this course with a four-year-old iPad. I didn't use an iPad Pro. And I did that on purpose because you don't have to have the latest greatest to make it work. It actually works surprisingly well with the older technology. So if you're interested in learning more, you can check it out at my website at ifilmmakers.tv. And definitely don't forget to check out Richard's stuff on social media and YouTube as well. This has been another episode of Almost Professional. I'm your host, Blake Calhoun. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.